right so let's start looking at our examples we have a, quite a number of them to go through so let's get started and the first place I want to start is here on line 16 okay and if you look what I'm doing I have some JavaScript in my HTML and I say I want to create a function called my controller it doesn't really matter what the name of this function is it's still gonna work it doesn't matter trust me you'll see that in a minute so I give my function a name and then I said my function uh, accepts a parameter it just some this parameter is called scope and it begins with a dollar sign don't worry, let that confuse you in JavaScript using dollar sign as part of your variable name is totally valid we didn't cover it but that's one of the things that you can do in JavaScript including using underscore uh, um, if I'm not mistaken I'm pretty sure underscore also so you could do like underscore scope also is a valid JavaScript name right some other language use underscore also uh, as the first allowable letter in um, character in a variable name so scope is just a variable um, Angular chooses to put a dollar sign there for its own reason, but don't worry about that. So it's just a variable. So my function accepts a variable, and that variable happens to be, I know, it's a Java object. Remember, objects, we can assign keys and values to them. So for, my, for this object that's being passed in, I'm going to assign a key called name, and I'll give it the value varo. Again, this doesn't look any different than if I had done this. Okay? So that's all it is. Now, and a matter of fact, since this is internal to my code, it actually would still work, but whatever. Um, let's just stay with the convention and use the dollar sign. So that's a function, nothing new there. Um, line 20, um, what I did was since I'm including the JavaScript library, now I can, it gives me this global object now called Angular. So it introduces, this library introduces an object called Angular. And no, I can call that object, and I can say object that module. I'm going to call a function module on that object, and I'm going to pass it a string. And because what I'm saying is create Angular, I want you to create a module for me, and I'm going to give that module that you're going to create. I'm associated with a string called my app, and then I'm passing this empty array. This is required, and again, just accept that this is how it is for now. There's a reason for it. I'll explain that later. So we're just trying to go through this, get going, and then only focus on what we need to know for now. So we, not, we don't need to know why there's an empty array here. Just imagine that you can pass in other stuff here, and for now we're not passing in anything. But even though I'm not passing in anything, I cannot leave this out, for example. I can't pass it, call it like this, because that have a totally different meaning than this. All right. So this means I'm creating this module called my app, the other way, it means I'm looking up a reference to this module that may exist. Okay? So that's why you have to pass that. All right. So now that I have this variable uh, representing this module that I created here, usually we call it an application. So in Angular, we're going to use the word module and app interchangeably. Don't let that confuse you. And so I say I have my Angular app here, and I'm going to say on this app, I'm going to call a controller method. To again define just like on the angular method I, um, object I call the modules method to create a module now I'm gonna call a controller method on this on my application module and tell it that oh hey I want to create something a controller with this name my controller and the implementation for that controller is in this function here now you could see why the function doesn't matter because there's just a reference or a handle to that function so it could be anything as a matter of fact, I could make this an anonymous function by just copying this, sticking it in here, and of course removing the name. It wouldn't matter to JavaScript, right? It's just for simplicity, that's why I do it separately, instead of you having to twist your brains to try and figure it out. But we've seen that already where we put anonymous function in another function call. Okay? All right, so that's all that's new here. This is not really new, except that I'm saying I'm taking an object and I'm going to attach some stuff to it. And so since Angular, I'm telling Angular this is my controller, now Angular knows about my function, and of course Angular is going to be the one calling my function, preparing this object and passing it in, okay? So that's all I care about. Now how does this tie into the rest of the stuff? Well, let's look. On line 2, before, when we were looking at Angular, we had this. We just had ng app, and we didn't um, assign it a value, that, that attribute, okay? Um, the directive, the ng directive, we use it as an attribute and it didn't have a value. Now, 
we are assigning a value and we're saying my ng application is this module that I've created here. And so this is where these two must match up. Whatever you're using here must be this. And then on line eight, I said I have a directive and I, I define a thing, uh, use another um, a div tag anyway, and I say that oh, I have a directive here in G controller. And again, I set a value, and this, the only important thing is that these two match up, here and here. Remember, this doesn't matter, because this could have been an anonymous function or any other function name, doesn't matter. This is where, what's important. Now, what does this really do? All it says is, for this div, anything that's nested inside this div, if there's a variable here, a module, a model being used, I can look it up inside this controller. So if you, you see that. So now, when I say ng model here for this input, Angular is going to say, oh, you have a model name tied to this input. Let me see if this controller defines a model call name. And it certainly does. So I'm going to take the value vero and put it inside of this input. And of course, I'm going to put vero here also because it's the same thing. And so now when I type into this input, of course, we know from before that it would change this, but now that I have a controller with that same model, guess what? The value get updated in my controller also, right? You're not gonna see that right now, but just trust me. But at least you're gonna see, you're not gonna see the two way yet, but you're gonna see the one way, which is when I start my application previously in our previous examples, because we didn't have a controller, when I start my example, these values were all empty. This was empty, this was empty. Now you're gonna see it, so it's actually gonna start off with a value, meaning that it's gonna read it from that controller, it's gonna look it up. So let's go take a look at that now. Let's run it. And there's my code coming up. And there you see. There it is. Right? It loads it up. And just like before, it still works the same way. Right? And you didn't get to see that oh, it's, it's bonded um, to that value, but it is. All right? All right. So I hope that show you just how easily it is to introduce a controller. It's just a function. And takes an object and you can attach properties to that object. That's it. And this part is boilerplate. You're pretty much always going to do this. That's it. And then there's this change but and this change. Once you do this once, you don't have to do it again, right? And this, you're going to put this ng controller on a tag where you want um, the models inside that controller to be resolved. So you can put it at an IL level if you want. I could have put this ng controller here on my body tag or all the way up here. For example, if I wanted my title to get a value from a controller, I could put it all the way up there, okay? We'll see more of that later. So this has to do with scoping. All right, we talked about that a little bit before. So here's another example to show you how this operates. So the only thing I've changed here is I've duplicated this line here, but I've removed from the div the ng controller. So now we, we know from just now the example before that we know this is still going to work. I didn't change. I didn't change anything at the bottom here. So this obviously should work. But here, what's going on here? When this angle comes here and look at this model name, it doesn't find that a, a enclosing um, controller. So it just go, oh, I don't have a, um, con a variable defined already for this, a value. So there's none. And hence, this is going to have none either. But it does create the JavaScript variable for name anyway. And hence, we're going to be able to still be able to type into this box and have it result show up here. But there's no controller to initialize that value. So this is basically what we had before. And again, we can go back to our example. And uh, let's um, rerun. Stop that. Stop that. Rerun this. Right. And here's the first one. And of course, the second one doesn't have a value because there's no controller that initialized it, but this still works. Exactly what I said before. Here's this idea of nesting. So um, remember, so I said that how uh, each controller sort of introduces a scope depending on where you put it. And the link that I put in the slides for the AngularJS documentation really shows how scope work so you might want to just take a look at that if you want to see more but I, more details but 
I think what I'm going to show here and in the previous example should kind of give you enough that you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. So here I have on this diff tag, I say ng controller 1, and then I have a p tag with ng controller 2. So what do you should expect happen? When Angular goes to look up the value for this, um, this model name, it's going to look for the closest controller and say, hey, does controller 2 define a value for name? And if it does, then it would just use that. If it doesn't, then it would go to the author one and say, hey, is name defining controller 1? If it does, then it would use that. Now, here, name is not enclosed in this controller 2. Name is actually enclosed in controller 1, as you can see. The controller 2 is actually only on the P tag here alone, this P tag, right? This P element. So this guy, this name, is actually not even going to look up in here because it's not enclosed by that, but rather enclosed by controller 1. And so it will go look there for its value. And if it's defined there, use it. And if it's not, then it won't have a value. So I have two controllers. Again, just two functions, very simple. And I give them different values. And then I just register them. Again, pretty straightforward, OK? And of course, you can see from this, we can know what's going to happen. This first one is going to say, I'm going to look for a value in controller 2. What does controller 2 do? Controller uses Leroy. So this inner one, we should expect to say Leroy. This guy is going to look for a value in controller 1. And it's going to have Feral. This guy doesn't need to go to controller 1 because the closest controller is 2 and the value name is there. If name wasn't there, it would get the same, it would get a value from the other one if it's there. And of course, if it's not there. So let's go and look at the code. So there you see. First one says Leroy. Second one says Vero. And if I remove from the second one, um, if I call this name 2, for example, I'm going to save it. And so name is going to be looked up in controller 2, but it's not going to be there. So then it's going to go to controller 1, and it's going to find it. And so we should see both of them saying Veral. So let's refresh. And there we go, both of them saying Veral. OK? Pretty straightforward, all right? I hope. All right. So let me undo this. Um, all right. Next example. This is basically what we started with, where we had a number of um, controls to demonstrate how easy it is to use the different the ng model controller from our previous um, um, episode and about directives using simple directives and so we had name and this um, input and um, p tag to output it we had a checkbox we had two numbers with ranges and so on and so what i wanted to show here is that i could in my control i could just initialize all of them and so before we didn't have them initialize, and so now I've initialized them. And you know, I, I use a string true here, that's a mistake. But I actually should use just the Boolean true. And so there we go. If I go look now at this, I refresh, you'll see Vero, Vero. This is already checked because it's the Boolean value true. This is 15, and this is 12, right? Make sense? Right, so and nothing new. I just use more variables here, um, keys that on my scope. That's it. And of course, since this is an object, and you put object and object, I can actually do more complex things, but which we'll see in the next example. All right. So what about here? So this is the example where let's focus on this part for now. So I have a function, a controller, takes a scope. I have this JSON string that I constructed, just a very long JSON string, and all it contains is a key called country, and then for that key is an array, and in that array there are some objects, and each object includes the name, a country name, and then a name for the country, and a key called population. So it's just a nested data structure essentially, right? Where I have one object with a name and population key being nested into an array, an array of them, and then that array being a value for the country's key. And that's a JSON object, okay? And so remember, JSON object and um, Java object can be used very easily and they look pretty similar. 
And so I can say now I want to parse that JSON object. We talked about JSON before in our JavaScript um, chapter five. And I parse that JSON string and I get a JSON object. And now that object, um, I get um, a JavaScript object and I can store that in this key data. But that's a um, JavaScript object, so also a nested object representing this data. So nothing new. Again, and this you can imagine that oh, I fetched this information here. There was some command that went and fetched this from information from some remote site on my backend server or something. Remember that everything we're doing is running in the browser. We don't actually have a server anywhere that's pro pro providing us any data. So this is running the user browser. You can imagine that the user clicked the button or whatever, and it went out and it fetched this information. And now I pull it, bring it back, parse it, and um, no, it's my fill my controller, my control put it on the scope. And now let's go up here and look at our template, which Angular is going to use to render the view, right? And so this template again is HTML embedded with these um, handlebar um, constructs. And so, you know, this markup here. And so what I said, the only thing new here is I say, this is still um, my controller. That's fine. But I, now I put it on body, so I moved it up a little bit, but I could have put it anywhere. And I said, well, not anywhere, anywhere that I want to enclose this table. So I could put it here, for example, but I put it on body. So I introduced a new directive here, one called ng repeat. And ng repeat is pretty simple and very convenient and useful. You're going to use it quite a bit. And I say C in data that countries. Remember, data is coming from our controller, right? It's that. Um, JavaScript object that's been parsed from the JSON string and it says it's for, create a variable C and for every instance of um, the object in the data that countries, remember data that countries is this array, right? That's what we see here. Country is an array, the value of country is an array. So when I reference data that countries, I'm getting this array and then each C is going to be assigned to one of this and then to this one, and then to this one, and keep going to each one of those, okay? And so now for each C, what do you want to do? I want to create a table data that C that name, and then that'll create table data that C that population. So this thing is going to repeat this TR. So multiple TR table rows will be created, and each table row will have these two um, table data. And so just let's take a look at that. It's very simple, and there you go. It renders this table. So you see how useful and quick and easy that is, right? To do in Angular, we didn't have to type up all that, so we just say repeat um, thing. And so now, once I've written that once, if for example I added more countries in this list, it would render correctly, and I could put in something here. I could insert another um, object here, and I'm going to call it name. And I'm going to say the value is me. <laughs> and then um, I'm going to say, um, what was the next thing? Population. There's the next key. Yeah, if I could only type. And then the value here is 5, for example. And if I save this and I go back here and I refresh, there you go, me and 5, right? I didn't have to change my template. All I did was update. Um, my thing alone, and that was all that was required. Okay. All right. So, I'm gonna take that out. Just wanted to show you. All right. Um, the final one is what we had from or from last week as a teaser, which was this. I call it time in that previous video. I'm calling it angular clock here, and basically. Um, what it is, is pretty much taking what we've learned so far, um, taking it a little, slightly a little step forward. And so let's focus on the function here, our controller. So we know that oh, there is nothing new here. We can quite literally um, move this here. Let's move it here so we don't confuse things, okay? So we have a function. And we call it time controller. Remember, the name here doesn't matter because it's just being used here. That's all. We take a scope variable, 
that's fine this is why we um exchange values between the control provide values to be used um on the view which you know angular used to substitute into the template here so time and so that's here if we just ignore this all we would expect to happen is if we run this code is we'll have an empty string of course nothing displayed right now what is this interval interval is a special um thing that angular object that angular provides and if you put it in your controller angular would see that oh you're asking for this interval and it would insert it you know call your time controller with it angular some does something called dependency injection and so it doesn't really matter the order in which you use this angular will just look for these names and then if it finds it it put an appropriate value and call it in the right order so don't worry about it so it looks and it sees oh dollar sign interval and says oh you want a scope and you want the dollar sign interval object and so it gives you a scope object give you a dollar sign interval object now what is the interval object an interval object is something that allows you to call it it's like a function reference to a function that allows you to call it with your own function and basically you given this function um, is a closure remember we talked about closure which are functions that close over values so here's a function I'm going to pass to interval and then this function makes reference or uses references scope that time which is defined in time control here so even um, if as we saw before in, in JavaScript because this has a reference to this variable it can update it from wherever it is you know wherever it's being called and so I'm passing a reference to this anonymous function I'm creating here which has a reference to time that close and I'm telling it, you know what I want you to do? Every second, I want you to call my function, this anonymous function I give you. So I'm telling interval to call my anonymous function periodically at one second interval. So this is a thousand milliseconds, okay? So 1,000 milliseconds is one second, is one second. So it calls this function every second. So what, it, what happens when it call it every second? Well. Let's ignore this part. This is just another function call. If I simply said new date, it would simply get the new date and assign it here. And of course, since it's assigned it here, JavaScript um, Angular would notice that though this is updated, time is updated, and my UI would also change. Remember, I tell you that two-way binding, right? Angular notices whether the model is changed from the UI and updated in the back end, and vice versa, if it's changed in the controller, it updates on the UI. And hence why we would see the time changing on the UI without us just doing anything. We don't have to refresh our page or anything. The other thing I did was I took advantage of some filters that Angular have and provides. And we don't have to talk about filters, but just know there's something called a filter. And think of them as special function that do cool things for you. They're very useful. So there's one called a date filter. And I had that inserted also. And dependency injected. And I'm calling that filter with the new date, and I'm saying I want the format to be medium. The short, there's all kinds of different formats. You can specify your own format. And we're going to look at documentation for filter in a future video. So that's all this is doing. It's calling a piece of anonymous code. And the reason I want it is because if this is a clock, the time needs to be updated. So I need some way of repeatedly calling to get the current time, get the current time. And I want to do that every second. It doesn't make sense for me to do that more often than a second because if I made this like less than a thousand milliseconds for example it, it most of the time it call is gonna still have the same value so why okay and so I wanted to look like a clock so I wanted to do at least you know every second now if you wanted to cut your time to increase every minute then again multiply this by you know just put 60,000 here all right so now let's go take a look at this and so there you go, and you see the time is just taken by every second, okay? Now if I change the format here to short, you know, I wouldn't see necessarily, the, let's see, refresh, let's see? So I don't see the date involved in it, and I don't see the seconds. So now, if I were to use format short, there's no reason for me to call this every second because there's no update here, so why, why call it, right? So in that case, I would change this to 60, call this every 60,000. And so that's the only reason. Now, if I didn't use a filter, for example, and instead I did this,
right? This is what it looks like, right? And I'm seeing the milliseconds here, um, you know, being caused. It's almost not quite exactly a thousand milliseconds. Um, so it, it's kind of close. It's some variability. I mean, you can't expect that, right? It can't be exactly that. But you can still see the seconds ticking by here, and these are the milliseconds here. I just within that range, right? Um, so I was 700 or something, I was 800 milliseconds. It's getting called for every second. So this, the, the, using the date filter just allowed me to get a nice format because look at this. Do you want to read this? No, I can guarantee you, regardless of where you are in the world, when you um, run this code, it's going to format it properly based on your um, locale. Okay, so if in your location the month and so on are displayed differently and use different characters between the seconds and so on, it will be it will show it correctly. I don't have to think about it. So those are some of the advantages that you get with Angular. Now I know this video is going on a bit long, and so I kind of wanted to slow it down. I just kind of let you get a feel for it, uh, the controllers, because we're going to be using controllers uh, in our code because we can write. Too many complex application without this idea of a controller. You could see with the directive, yeah, we were able to do some very cool thing, but you need to initialize values before. You might need to either get things from the back end or send things to the back end or do some kind of computation, and that's where your controller comes comes in. Okay, so don't worry if you don't get all of it in this video. Please go back and start off with this very first um, example. Kind of just look at the one, stare it, stare at it, and see. Um, get this at least to work and understand this. Uh, the place you really want to start, I think, is to understand that this is simply just a function and I'm passing in a object and that object, um, you can assign things to it. In this case, Angular is going to pass in that object to you. Don't worry about the fancy, funny name there with a the dollar sign. Just accept that as the letter of the law and you, you do that. And then these other thing is just, oh, it makes sense that um, I, I have to create somehow integrate with Angular, so I'm going to tell it I want to create a mod application module and I attach my controls to an application modules. Now, you may say, well, Farrell, well, can you create multiple application modules? You surely can. And so Angular is designed for if you want to build really big application and hence why you can create multiple application modules and that's why you can stick your controller pretty much anywhere and say, oh, I want this controller to be responsible for this part of my page and this controller to be part of another part of my template, whatever and this Angular module is responsible for this part or whatever. So again, you can use move your Angular NG app anywhere you like. And so we'll, we'll see more of that. Just don't worry about it. Just try to get this, uh, this basic example working and, and just try to understand it. And then if you can, then move on to the other ones and just go through, look at the video again. Of course, if you have problems, just let me know. All right.